How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. This is Lee Times 51.2 volt, 100 amp hour golf cart battery. It's meant to go in a golf cart, but a battery is a battery. You can still use it in a battery backup system. Although if you're gonna build it from scratch, I would recommend to buy server rack batteries instead. This is really, really just for a golf cart. It's built so that there's even a little interface so you can put it on the dash of your golf cart. The pigtail on the charger is meant to attach to the battery, but this end over here, it actually plugs up so it's water tight when you're not charging. It. Typically when you're driving the golf cart, you need to disconnect this plug. So this plug is a bit more durable. And after you unplug it, you can take it with you on the golf cart or you just leave it in the garage. Golf cart batteries are usually this little square blocky thing rather than the server racks, which is a little bit shorter, a bit longer and a bit wider. It's a different form factor. This one, you'll notice that the top has a lid that has a lip that comes over a little bit. This helps it a little bit more in case any kind of water drips on it. It's not gonna go inside the battery. Being a golf cart battery, you can do up to 600 amps surge. So if you're trying to get over a bump or something like that, it might take up to 600 amps. That is equivalent to 30 kilowatts. Although it's a 200 amp EMS, Many times you can run these things over until the internal components are overheated. The design intention though is that it can do 100 amps continuous. That means you can run this thing at maximum or five kilowatts or so for an entire hour before this thing can deplete from 100% to 0%. So a lot of energy in here. I did a capacity test on this battery, draining about 30 to 50 amps on average, took about three hours and I got a capacity of 100 amp hours and it cut off at around 41.5 volts. The battery itself did that, not my inverter. And then I went to do the charge test. This is the charger that pairs with this. Unfortunately though, the first time I ran it, the little stickers fell off from the side just probably because of the heat. Here it says 18 amps output. On the meter, I logged it in at 17.8 amps. Interestingly though, as the voltage changes, the amperage stays about the same. So as it charges it up, it actually uses more and more power. Using the charger, charging from MT, I got 100 amp hours, and this took five hours and 45 minutes. Let me describe a little bit of what's going on in this whole thing here. We have the display that comes with this. This allows you to plug it in and check the state of charge. There's quite a bit of wiring over here, so you can snake this all the way to like the front control so you can monitor this and you can turn it off if you want to so it won't consume back light energy. Just press and hold it and it turns off. I've also connected an inline resistor to measure the capacity here. It requires two sense wires that goes straight to the battery. No current goes through here, it's only sensing the voltage. When it consumes no current, then the voltage is very accurate. Otherwise, when there is a current that flows through these wires, there's a voltage drop making the sensing inaccurate. These two wires that goes to this resistor over here also doesn't really consume any current, so there's no voltage drop. So the sensing of the voltage across this very low ohm resistor is very accurate as well. The on off button has a light and it'll illuminate green when it's on. If you turn this off, the battery terminals will be cut off from the rest of the system. The reading doesn't jump around as much as this one. So there's probably a bit of smoothing in this unit as compared to this one. This one is like reading it straight out. You have the voltage, you have the state of charge, which is very important. The state of charge on this one seems much, much more accurate than the state of charge on this meter over here. And then you can turn this charge on or discharge off, and then there's a next page here too. A very simple control that allows you to monitor the stats, state of charge, and also if you wanna turn off the battery using this panel, you can. Because this battery is 100 amp hours, I went through great lengths to upgrade my hybrid inverter system so that it can pull 100 amps. 100 amps from this 51.2 volt battery means it's five kilowatts. That's a lot of power. I actually don't have a golf cart, but it's possible to integrate this into a hybrid inverter battery system. Let me show you guys what I did with my inverter. It's an eco-worthy five kilowatt hours. I ran it for about one year already. I have 1600 watts of solar coming in. It maxes out around 1200 watts or so. And usually I don't run it that hard, maybe two kilowatts or something. It might peak around three or four kilowatts if I have the microwave oven on. But over here, I initially installed a 25 amp breaker. That means each of these circuits max out at 
three kilowatts. This is a five kilowatt inverter, so that means I need two of them. I initially did plan to have two of them, but I got kind of lazy and only installed one of them. But I added the second one, and I know this whole thing looks very crazy. It's unprotected, so this entire room is you know, kind of like an electrical room. I did some pre-testing on this, and it turns out that even though I'm drawing five kilowatts from the battery, the inverter says it's only using about 4.2 or something like that. So the inverter is actually a five kilowatt output inverter, not five kilowatt consuming inverter because there's some inefficiency, right? So I'm thinking it can go all the way up to maybe like around six kilowatt and actually five kilowatts is going to the output on all these AC ports over here. So I can draw that much and kind of force that battery over there to maybe pull around 120 amps continuous for as long as this thing can handle it. So let's try to do that right now. In order to put this much load on this battery, I actually have to have three power banks and also I need to turn on my car charging, plug four different things into this inverter. So I got a bunch of power stations laying around. This one can consume up to 1200 watts. Another one that'll do 1400 watts. Another one that'll do 1800 watts. And the car charging will do 1400 watts for a grand total of 5,800 watts. So it looks like I can probably push this to maybe around 115 or 120 amps or so. I'll put a timer here to see how long it can last. Now we're actually above 100 amps now. So I'll be curious on how long it will, oop. It is my hybrid inverter that turned off. So not the battery's fault. My inverter is pretty close to maximum at 4.9 kilowatts. This is a five kilowatt inverter as shown there. And on the battery, I'm taking out 93.4 amps, 4.73 kilowatts. So this is as high as I can get it. So I'm just gonna reset the timer here and it should be able to completely drain this battery at this high rate. I added another 100 watts draw to one of my power stations. It says five kilowatts now and we're at 99.4 amps. So let me just let this run. Checking six minutes later, my black cable's at 134 degrees Fahrenheit. The resistor is very hot, 142, but can still touch 140 degrees Fahrenheit and not burn yourself. But over here is more worrisome for me, getting a little bit warm at this battery cable input. Working temperature is 105 C for these cables that I have. It's at 171. It's not reaching much higher than that, so I think we're okay. Let's see these cables, 141. But somehow this cable is getting a little bit warmer. I might need to tighten that later on. Uh, it might be a tightening issue. 41.5, it should cut off almost right now. 40 volts, it should cut off any, oh, right there. The battery itself cut off because this is blinking red and green. That's pretty cool, 100 amps discharge for a full 28 minutes right around five kilowatts of discharge power. So now we have 1100 watts of solar coming back in to charge this battery from zero. It's actually pretty nerve wracking here because I never ran the system at this high of power. One of my power stations, it started getting full. So when it does that, it starts drawing less power. So I had to add other power stations to do more draw. I'll let this charge back up and then we're gonna take it offline and examine what's inside. Here are the battery specifications if you're interested. It comes with this positioning plate. These are just basically the holes that lines up with the holes on the battery at the bottom. There are some standoffs here. Your lead acid batteries is supposed to look like that. There's six of them inside your golf cart and you put the same battery inside that compartment. So there's gonna be a lot of empty space in there now. So you'd attach these brackets to the bottom of that golf cart battery compartment. Position those brackets with this fiberglass plate. This is stiff enough so that you know you're not gonna make a mistake. And then attach these brackets to the cart. Afterwards, you wouldn't need this fiberglass plate. You bolt them in like so on each side like that. This control interface connects with the 485 port and it also comes with these terminal covers. So you attach your battery in here. These screws here are not connected to the terminal. There's a vent hole here that has a bunch of holes and we can turn on the battery just by pushing it on off. The control panel, I can just push the on off button and it comes up. Can even go in here to power it off. Confirm to shut down the battery system, yes. So it's gonna shut this 
panel down. And after a few moments, the battery itself turns off and there's no voltage at the output terminals. The handles are spring loaded. So after you use them, they try to push themselves back onto the surface. I want to show you guys this lip in this golf cart battery. Any kind of water that gets on here, it's going to fall off a little bit towards the side. Sort of like a roofing element here. Let's flip this upside down. This whole thing appears to be a metal can that's completely sealed. There's no holes anywhere. No rubber feet down here. It's just completely flat. At least for disassembly wise, it's very nice to have the screws here. We have a lead time branded BMS, 100 amp charge and 100 amp discharge. These are continuous numbers, but in the manual, it did say 200 amp BMS, 100 amp continuous charge, 100 amp discharge. 16 S, 100 amp, meaning 16 of these lithium iron phosphate cells in series and they're all 100 amp hours. Going from the positive battery terminals, it goes to one of the cell packs and internally it connects to the next one, to the next one all the way down here. And this long pack connects with this long pack down here and all the way back. After it gets back over here, it gets connected to the BMS through four eight gauge cables. And there's a whole bunch of FETs that's inside this BMS that connects the battery to the output. They need a lot of these FETs to minimize the on resistance. Here you have another four eight gauge cable that goes to the output negative terminal over here. This wire here is to supply the board with the power. This is the red and green power button with the switch. So a bunch of lines that goes to this button over here. This is the RS485 cable and also the CAN cable. If we look very carefully, the RS485 cable has a 12 volt, a ground, a 4A5A and a 4A5B and a CAN low and a CAN high. The CAN low and can high goes straight to this connector over here. So it's using the same exact line as what's in the RS485 port. It's just in a different connector. Down here, there are five pairs of wires that goes to five different thermocouples. One of them goes to all the MOSFETs in here and the four other ones goes one right here, one right here, one right here, and one right here. So we can see all of the thermocouples right on top. If we take a close look at that, this is a bimetal sensor. It's not as accurate to other temperature sensors, but as long as it trips when it overheats to, you know, a few degrees, then it's good enough. Curious that they put it all on top over here rather than sort of like put some on top, put some on the bottom, some on the side or something. Here you see your typical balancing lines because there are 16 cells in this thing. It would need 17 total wires. The red wire goes to the positive terminal and each successive wire goes to in between the cells and the very last wire is black. It goes to the negative terminal. You'll see all these connectors are sort of glued in place with this little white silicone stuff. At least this stuff that is connected to the thermocouples is supposed to be thermally conductive. It would be sort of a waste to use thermally conductive glue over here, but I don't know, maybe they can get it in bulk and it's cheap enough for them to just kind of use the same glue everywhere. All these cells in here, each one of them is one single cell and 100 amp hour. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times two rows of it, so 16 cells. And these two packs are connected with this big bar right here. It looks like if you remove all these electronics, these two cell packs would be separate entities. And on each side of these packs, there's bolted down by two screws, one, two, and then another two over here. So four screws for each of these packs. And it looks like there's a little hook right here for them to lower this really heavy battery pack down. I mean, each set of these battery packs is probably around 50 pounds or so because this whole thing is about 100 pounds. And each of these packs is bolted together by these metal frame things and secured with these screws on the side. In between these cells, they sandwich some material in between. In case something happens to one of the cells, it won't kind of contaminate the next cell. Look at this vent hole from the inside. In case this builds up too much pressure, it can escape through that hole. Now we're looking at in between these batteries here. From what I can tell, there are no markings on top of these cells. Looking in this crevice over here, I cannot see any kind of barcode. There's really no reason to take this apart further. Instead, I'm gonna to see what lead time will say about uh, what kind of cell these are and who manufactures them. If you're gonna get this battery, I highly recommend to get it for a golf cart, not for a backup battery system. The accessories is just all intended for a golf cart. If you guys are interested in this battery, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.